Last time, we hinted at the connection between word to vec and looking at an SCD over, say, the pointwise mutual information between word co-occurrences. And what I want to talk a little bit more about today is what are the details that make word to vec a little bit better. One of the problems with these approaches is that they're overly sensitive to rare words. And so, for example, if you look at what are the things closest to king, you get very, very specific examples and not necessarily the kind of associations that a human would have. These approaches have access to large amounts of information and they can find associations that are very specific and very accurate, but not necessarily representative of what, say, a normal person would think of when you say the word king. And another issue is that it doesn't scale very well that we talked about a little bit last time. But what I want to focus on more is the notion that they don't work as well. And to do that, we're going to detail a little bit more of the inner workings of word to vec so that we can more closely examine why it works well, and maybe those ideas can apply to these other methods as well. So in particular, what we're going to look at is pre-processing, post-processing, and the association metrics. And so, for example, in word to vec you have these dynamic context windows and other word representations use things like additive context vectors. How big of a role do these things play? So, for example, word to vec uses what's called a dynamic context window, where not all of the context words matter as much. And so, for example, in word to vec you have this decay as you get further and further away from the context word. And this seems to be relatively important, that you can't just count all words as being equal. It's very important for Wapamuk to have very high similarity with little and hiding, less so furry and in and, and so on. So you have this decay as you go out. And other approaches use different decay as you go out, but in any event, you focus your attention on the things actually closest to the focus word. Another thing that you can do is instead of multiplying the word and context vector, you can represent, say, the focus word as the word and the context, adding them together. And so breaking this division between the word vector and the context vector. Uh, there's a nice paper from Omer Levy that basically shows that this is the big difference that love is making. And so while there are many differences between all of these approaches, it's important to focus on the aspects that actually make them different. And many of the ideas can transfer across each other, and there can be some cross-fertilization that leads to a better overall representation so that you can take the best of all possible worlds. Another important aspect of word to vec that made it work so well is that it uses this smoothing term, this helps alleviate the rare word phenomenon that we saw for the PMI-based methods. And so given a probability distribution, they raise everything to the alpha power. And this seems to help quite a bit, and they use alpha equal to 0.75. And if you apply this to PMI, and you uh, smooth these distributions in the same way, you can get results almost as good as word to vec. So we've talked about all of these little tweaks and nudges that you can do to get better word vectors, but many people believe that this is a cottage industry and it's not really going anywhere. And creating individual word vectors is not necessarily a useful way to spend your time. And a similarity and association have been done to death. And simply getting better similarity and association scores is mostly a game of getting more data at this point and not necessarily where you're going to see the next revolution. So while innovation is still possible, you should look at other languages other than English. We'll talk about that more in a second. Or you should look at tasks where you're specifically having problems. And so can you figure out what task you want to focus on? And then you can tailor word representations specific to that task, and you'll likely have a better research outcome as a result. The other takeaway of knowing about all of these knobs that go into these word representation approaches 
is that you now have a better sense of what the hyperparameters are. And so word to vec isn't just a black box. You can play with the way that context decays you get further out from the focus word. You can choose your smoothing coefficient explicitly. These all become hyperparameters that you can tune. And you should tune them, you know, and you should tune them, and you should know what the hyperparameters are. Okay, so given this little rant, I don't want you to think that word representation is a solved problem. It's definitely not a solved problem, particularly when you look at other languages. And so, for example, if you look at Hebrew, uh, there are huge differences because of things like inflection and declension. And so the same word takes on different forms depending on the words around it, based on tense, on gender, and things like that. And so you have an agreement between adjectives and nouns based on gender, and this leads to an explosion in the number of types that you have to represent in your vocabulary, and you can't necessarily use individual rows in a context vector to describe all of this. You may not have enough data, particularly for rare adjectives. Then there are other aspects, such as Hebrew and some Native American languages also have basically affixes for prepositions, what we would think of as prepositions in English. And this is something that you cannot capture easily with word vectors that just take every combination of letters as a discrete word. That simply doesn't work for many languages. Another big problem is that there's ambiguity. And so the same string can correspond to different meanings. So this is a problem in English. You can have a word like bank correspond to a geographical feature. It can correspond to turning an airplane. It can correspond to a financial institution. You don't want all of these to have the same vector representation. You want to be able, based on the context, to figure out what is the right representation for those words. And this is an even bigger problem for languages like Arabic or Hebrew, where often, when you're writing somewhat informally, you don't write the vowels. And so the same sequence of consonants can correspond to many different meanings. So hopefully, uh, in our discussion of word representations, I've managed to convince you that this is a difficult problem and an interesting one. In the future, we're going to talk about how we can use word representations in more complicated models, where we're looking at entire sentences and trying to learn representation over an entire sentence. And we'll also look at how we can represent documents in a continuous space.